I'm very pleased to welcome and introduce Francois Rene Dussault, Michelle Jensen, and Peggy Gillespie. Francois Rene Dussault has Alport syndrome, a genetic condition that is primarily characterized by kidney disease, hearing loss, and sometimes eye abnormalities. At 30 years of age, he started peritoneal dialysis. Two years later, he received his first kidney transplant, which unfortunately failed after only two years. He then did nocturnal hemodialysis at home for almost five years. He received his second transplant almost 13 years ago. He has been actively engaged with the Kidney Foundation since 2004, participating in the Ottawa Chapter Advisory Council, the Ottawa Branch Government Relations Committee, and the National Programs and Public Policy Committee. He is also a volunteer with the Kidney Foundation Peer Support Program. In 2004, he successfully lobbied to obtain a tax credit from the City of Ottawa on the water and sewer bill for patients on home hemodialysis. He is a lawyer with Justice Canada and lives in Ottawa. A very busy man. Peggy Gillespie describes herself as a wife, a mother, a sister, a friend, a student, an administrative assistant, and a nephrology patient. She was diagnosed with glomerulonephritis in 1979, and she started on home hemodialysis in a small town in New Brunswick. Over the past 41 years, she has had experience with, get this, home hemodialysis, in-center hemodialysis, self-care hemodialysis, continuous, continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, automated peritoneal dialysis, and has had two successful kidney transplants. Peggy has been back doing hemodialysis for 19 years now, and for the past six years or so, has chosen to do her dialysis treatment at home. She consults with the home dialysis unit staff when needed, but is proud to be able to control and perform her own treatment safely and comfortably at home. Lastly, Michelle Jensen is a nephrology social worker in Halifax. She works with dialysis patients and kidney donors at the Queen Elizabeth II Health, Center, Health Science Center. Michelle began her social work career in 1993 and she worked in geriatrics and mental health before eventually joining nephrology at QE2 in 2006. She has worked with kidney patients across the entire continuum of care, including all modalities and transplant. Michelle finds her role very meaningful and rewarding, and she is very happy to, part to be participating in this panel today. I wonder if we could cue the poll. We have just a few brief questions we would like to put to the group. and. Uh, please answer as best you can. We'll give a minute to tabulate the results. So now you've heard my very brief descriptions of Peggy, Francois, Rene, and Michelle, but I think it's really best to hear it from them. And I would like to start by inviting Peggy. Let's start with you. Can you describe your kidney care journey over all those years through the lens of being what you describe as an engaged and empowered patient? Um, well, I good evening, everyone, and thank you. Um, I, I live in Hammonds Plains, Nova Scotia, and I'm currently doing home hemo uh, dialysis three days a week, 3.5 hours per treatment. Uh, I chose to do this six years ago as my son was now in his mid-20s, and my husband's uh, working outside of the home. Uh, I had already been doing self-care uh, hemodialysis in center for the previous four years. And the winter of 20, 2015 was just a terrible for traveling. Um, so these things came together and helped make this decision. Uh, and my healthcare team was willing to help me make this transition as easy as possible. Um, I felt comfortable doing hemodialysis in my home as I had done hemo home hemodialysis in 1979 when I was first diagnosed. Um, I'm no longer on a transplant list uh, 
after having two uh, successful kidneys uh, transplants. Um, but I've had wonderful support system from the healthcare providers, my families and my friends. It's just been very good. And I've been empowered by many people throughout the 41 years, uh, almost on a daily basis uh, because of my healthcare uh, people, nurses, doctors, staff, uh, and my family and friends. It's, it's been important for me. That's about it. <laughs> Thanks, Peggy. Thank um, Francois, Renee, I would love to hear your brief journey through a similar perspective of being an empowered patient. What does that look like from your perspective? Well, uh, my journey started um, at uh, when I was 30 years old. Um, I had long known before that I had Alport syndrome, but my uh, kidneys failed really when I was 30 years old and I had to start peritoneal dialysis. Um, and uh, it wasn't easy, obviously. Uh, uh, although it was something that I knew was coming up, you know, it wasn't sudden. So, but it, it, it wasn't still easy to, to begin the treatments. Uh, I did that for two years and really my hope during those two years was uh, getting a transplant. That was my goal, getting a, a kidney transplant. And it did happen. Um, I was lucky, uh, not even two years after starting uh, peritoneal dialysis, I was called for a transplant because the match was extremely good. Uh, I was actually pulled out of the waiting list. Um, I was waiting for a, an organ from a deceased donor, given that um, uh, Alport syndrome runs in my family. My mom carries the gene and me and my brother both have it. Uh, my brother also is living with a transplant right now. Mm -hmm. So I was waiting for a deceased donor and um, it did happen pretty quickly, but unfortunately, um, uh, the love affair with the kidney, if I can say, didn't last too long. Uh, even if it was a great match, uh, I started a few months after the transplant, a chronic rejection, and I lost a kidney barely two years after receiving it. Um, and and uh, yeah, I had then to do hemodialysis. Uh, PD wasn't something that worked well enough in terms of uh, dialysis. So I had to do uh, hemodialysis and I decided to uh, do it myself at home. Um, and, and no, at night. Uh, and I did this for about uh, almost five years until I received a second transplant uh, 13 years ago in 2008 uh, and this wasn't the perfect match but you see it's um, it's been 13 years so it means something <laughs> um, and uh, I'm living happily with it um, throughout that journey very briefly I'll say the transplant in my case was always the goal um, I was, you know, I said I started in, in uh, 30 years old. Uh, I have a active professional life. I love traveling. So the transplant was the best treatment uh, in, in my situation. Um, and uh, since I got the second transplant, uh, I mean, it, it's fantastic. I've been uh, outside the COVID situation, I've been able to travel uh, quite a lot internationally and, and within the country. Um, even during uh, the time I was on dialysis, either PD or hemo, I did travel a bit outside the country uh, with some organization. Um, and in making all these choices uh, in between the transplant uh, in terms of PD and hemodialysis, uh, I can say I had a word to say in, in the choice of the treatment I wanted. And that choice was 
basically um, uh, based on my lifestyle. Uh, therefore, doing uh, dialysis at home for me was my preferred choice. Thanks, Francois Renee. And so many of the words you say, choices, and Peggy, when she said she's been empowered, these are things I really want to put to Michelle. Michelle is a renal social worker, and she deals with, has dealt with hundreds, if not thousands of patients. Speak to us about patient empowerment from the other side of the gurney, Michelle. Thank you, Craig and Peggy and Francois Rene. Really, um, I feel like you've you've just heard um, a great sort of summary of what patient empowerment is. Really, um, Peggy and Francois Rene epitomize, I think, patient empowerment and the way in which it can really be woven throughout a patient's um, kidney journey. And I guess the words that stand out for me are uh, engaged, active, involved, adaptable. Just listening to both Peggy and, and Francois Rene, hearing about the, the adaptations that they made, different stages of their life, different treatment modalities, and um, the choices that they made around that and what helped inform those, those decisions. Really, I think that helps to illustrate living your best possible life with kidney disease and epitomize our theme. One of the things that we talked about as we prepared for today was the fact that really um, this does not happen overnight for patients. It's not just, okay, I'm, I'm going to be empowered today. It's a gradual process that really comes over time through experience, through the development and establishment of partnerships and relationships. And so we really felt like our goal for today was to demystify empowerment and to really try to reassure all those who are taking part today. This is, this is a very broad concept, but there's no one definition. And it, it really is um, quite, um, quite personalized, I think, as we've heard from what, what has been shared so far. So really, we're hoping that you're going to, um, just by being here, really, uh, begin to reflect on ways that you're already involved in your care, on the ways in which you'd like to become more involved, and um, so that you can really live your best possible life with kidney disease. One of the things that struck, struck me as important to share was that the World Health Organization defines patient empowerment as a process. And it's a process through which patients and individuals gain greater control over decisions and actions that affect your health. And that really requires understanding your role, um, having an ability to engage with your care team and participate in um, shared decision-making, really learning skills and, and seeking support for ways in which to be involved in terms of self-management. And as a, as a renal social worker, that definition really speaks to me as it's really at the heart of, of my role and that of other renal professionals is to try to promote patient empowerment and self-management. And, and really that's, that's something that's so important in terms of helping to uh, make informed decisions, gain greater control over your treatments and, and really hopefully have, have better outcomes. Uh, a key part of this, I think, is education, and that's something that's been touched on already, and learning as much as you can about the different treatment options, what's going to work best for you at different times in your, in your kidney journey, and taking as much control as, as you can, recognizing that sometimes with a, either be it a new diagnosis or a new phase of your kidney journey, there can maybe be a sense of of having lost some control or um, entering a time of great uncertainty and perhaps stress, but finding ways to, um, you know, reassert some control or regain some control 
becoming active in your treatment and developing connections with your team, I think are ways to increase a sense of, of having more control once again, or reclaiming a sense of control. Uh, some of our education involves talking with, with patients about the fact that really you're you're in the driver's seat. You're the, the MVP, the most valuable player. And the renal professionals are, are really here to kind of coach and provide guidance and direction. And, and, and yet you're really at the, the heart of it, the center of the care that is provided. So as a renal social worker, I feel that learning about patient strengths is, is really at the heart of empowerment in that, you know, kidney patients, I mean, it's the the kidney community is so diverse, and such a range of patients, um, and different strengths and skills. And so learning about those individual strengths, I think helps to shape the type of care that we provide and helps to personalize that care. And, and really, I think that that's, that's what enables renal professionals, at least we strive to provide patient-centered care. So one of the things that I think is, is, is vital is, is really helping to provide guidance around navigating the healthcare system, navigating the renal program, and providing guidance and direction um, to wherever patients may be on their journey. Feel free if at any time, Craig, you want me to, you know, pause. I have a, I have a question. And okay. you've said a lot. And I like the point about it's a process. People who first learn they have kidney disease are overwhelmed. And I'm, I would love to hear from Peggy. Peggy, why is it important to take an interest in your healthcare team and who they are and what they're saying? Um, what's at risk if you don't? Well, I, I had once had a, a nephrology uh, doctor, a nephrologist say to me, uh, at times you really have to be your own doctor. And that has stuck with me over the years because I'm the only one who knows my body, uh, what's going on and really knows it. Uh, I can tell people how I'm feeling and what might be going on with me and but I am the one that ultimately knows what is what and therefore um, I work with my healthcare team uh, to to uh, work these things through uh, uh, coming up with a dialysis uh, modality, treatment modality that works in my life at, at, at the time that I'm going through it. Um, and this helps me to have some, as Michelle said, control, um, some independence, uh, and knowing that I'm going to have a say makes me proud to be able to uh, relate that. Well said. Francois Rene, I'm, I'm curious. You spoke very well about putting your values and your priorities at the core of decisions. Have you always experienced with your care team that they've asked these questions? Like what's important to you, Francois Rene, when we're choosing to do dialysis or get on the transplant list? Or is that something you've had to learn how to advocate for? Uh, the, um, having the transplant again was my primary goal. And, and this is something I let know uh, my healthcare team uh, right from the outset. Um, Obviously, because I was waiting for a uh, deceased donor, uh, I had to still do dialysis. Uh, I was given a choice at the beginning between peritoneal and hemodialysis. Um, I, um, we didn't have at the time back in the uh, early 2000 peer support group, um, unfortunately. 
uh, like there are now, but uh, I had the chance to speak with someone who was uh, doing peritoneal dialysis and exchange to see a bit what was that like. Um, and I also went to visit a uh, hemodialysis center in Ottawa. And, you know, when you're 30, um, maybe any time, not just the age, but when I saw all the, when I saw the hemodialysis center with about 30 chairs, uh, it sort of scared me. And I said, no. I'll do peritoneal. I'm young enough, apparently, oh. to learn that. And um, this will also allow me to um, do it at home uh, and, and, and manage it throughout my working day at the office. Uh, if I need, maybe I'll have to take a day off here and there. But that I, I base that choice really on on my own personal values and my own lifestyle uh, at that time. Um, the second time, and, and again, what Michelle said, like there are phases uh, in which each phase you learn, like you progress, like I, I learned about PD during that phase. I learned about what is a transplant I learned about losing a kidney transplant, which probably was the toughest learning in my experience, even uh, more than losing my own kidneys, which I had learned you know, a, a few years before that it would happen. But losing a transplant, something that I wanted, that was my goal, um, was very difficult. Uh, so I had to go through that and then learn again a new experience, which was hemodialysis. Um, and this time I didn't really have the choice uh, for hemodialysis because PD, uh, I wasn't dialysing sufficiently at my age uh, on PD. So I had to do hemodialysis. That wasn't a choice, but then I was offered another choice. Uh, and this one was to do it um, at night, during the night, what we call nocturnal hemodialysis. Um, I was interested uh, because again, it would allow me uh, to fit dialysis with my lifestyle, my work. Uh, I was also uh, very adamant with uh, having a, you know, the, the best dialysis possible. And what I was uh, hearing was that doing nocturnal would allow me um, having basically almost no diet restriction. I could drink as much as I wanted. Um, and uh, that pushed me uh, towards doing nocturnal hemo. So again, you know, it was based on my, on my own choices. Uh, it wasn't easy uh, to learn uh, hemodialysis. It wasn't easy to learn how to needle in the fistula. Um, it took me uh, two times. Uh, I started and after two days I quit. Uh, and, and it happens and you know I was what at that time I was uh, 33 years old uh, and I quit. Uh, it was overwhelming. And I went back and, you know, doing regular hemodialysis and center three times a week. I thought about it. I spoke to a friend of mine who was on nocturnal hemodialysis and um, she convinced me, you know, try again. And I, I tried the training a second time. Uh, I had a very patient nurse and I owe a lot to that nurse actually. Uh, she's in my heart. Uh, she has a special place in my heart. The, the nurse who trained me on hemodialysis and and um, that time I did it and and I did it after for about four and a half years and you know uh, it was fitting well uh, in my in my daily life I mean it's 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 a part time job definitely mm -hmm. but uh, it um, I it was it was something that I wanted at the end until I get the transplant. So uh, those decisions were made really based on 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 
my own personal life. Uh, they were made also with uh, in talking to friends and, and family. Uh, to I think it is extremely important to get the, the input of people uh, that care for you uh, and to give uh, some um, uh, oversight by, by other people. Uh, not uh, being just on your own, thinking about these things uh, and, and what the best choice is for you uh, by yourself. It, it's if you have people you can discuss with, uh, I think it's extremely important. They will give you very good insight, uh, especially the people uh, you're very close to, they, they know you. And, and, and can help you making those decisions. Thanks, Mr. Arwane. I, I appreciate what you said. And I, I wanna put it back to Michelle. You must come across patients who have no interest in asking questions, no interest in becoming partners in their care. I know my parents were from a generation that they never would have asked to learn more about their care or make decisions. How do you coach them and encourage them to be actual, as you say, partners in their care. You must have learned some tricks. Well, yes. I mean, I think it's important um, we to respect patients and where where they are and meet them there and recognizing that um, people have a different approach and different preferences and different abilities at any given point in time. So following their lead, but providing opportunities and making sure that uh, they know about ways in which they can be involved, even if that's as simple as learning more about what the results of their blood work means and um, really reassuring them that the renal dietitian is going to be their their best friend, who's going to really help them find what's going to work for them, not who's going to be checking up on them. And, you know, trying to help by helping them navigate and learn about their, their experience and what is available to them in the way of resources on the team, and different strategies that may help increase their understanding of their treatments, help to find the meaning in what's being done, um, maybe helping to provide connections. Francois Rene made reference to wishing there had been uh, peer support groups when on he was starting out. Peggy, I'm privileged to say, is one of the peer support volunteers in the renal program here in Halifax. And so helping to make those connections if a patient would really benefit from having that kind of support. So I think it really depends. It, um, it depends on the patient what what strategies might be the most effective. Also, as as you get to know a patient and learn about their interests and their strengths, maybe helping to inspire a sense of confidence that those skills which they don't think at are are at all transferable to dialysis, actually maybe are very transferable. And and the kinds of skills that have helped them to be a successful parent or employee or partner, friend, there's aspects of that that will help them be successful as a kidney patient. So helping to kind of connect the dots sometimes too and make those connections. Well said. I, I want to ask Peggy, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up peer support, uh, Michelle and Francois Renee. Peggy, you speak to patients. What do you say to offer them encouragement to be more active, to take more shared responsibility? You must have many conversations where people feel it's too much. They're overwhelmed. How do you support them? Um, again, just what Michelle said, to, to tell them that, you know, you don't have to know everything right away and you can you know, take time and do what you can and take a, you know, an interest in certain things in what you feel you can. Uh, as Michelle was talking, all I could think of was that, you know, for nine years in back on hemodialysis, I was raising my son, I was working, um, I was doing uh, other things outside 
So dialysis treatment for me was to go into the hospital, have dialysis done and leave. I did take an interest in my blood work. Um, I, you know, took an interest in what was happening to me, but I had no interest in taking over or doing anything. Um, so I tell people this, that, you know, it, it is time, uh, you know, you, you do what you can and you uh, just, you know, I started asking questions right from the very beginning in, in Moncton, New Brunswick, uh, when I first took sick. And uh, I just wanted to know what was going on with me. And that might be a first step. And, uh, but it's, it's a process and it's an education, like Francois Rene said. Um, and it, uh, that, that's how I, I just try to let people know that, you know, it's, it's fine to, to just breathe and go through this. And you can live a healthy, uh, you know, life while doing dialysis. Well said, Francois Rene, you, I, I know you make peer support connections. I've referred patients to you. What do you say to encourage them that they can take as much or as little co-ownership of their care as they want? You, you've talked to many people, what words resonate? How do you support them to feel empowered? Again, like what Michelle and Peggy just mentioned, um, I think you have to take it step by step. Um, it, it can seem overwhelming, especially when, you know, uh, Peggy and I have been through so much uh, over uh, the past many years. Uh, a lot of patients are at the beginning stage and it's a journey. Uh, uh, it's a journey uh, for the rest of your life. Uh, so it's step by step. Uh, and you progress uh, throughout that journey. You gain self-confidence. You gain knowledge of, of the treatments of yourself, how you respond to those treatments, not just physically, but also emotionally. Uh, so it, it's, it's a progression. You cannot expect to, uh, especially at the beginning, or it depends on everyone, but you can't expect to be fully empowered, you know, right from, from the beginning. Um, it's, uh, it's something that uh, you learn uh, and, and that um, is uh, important uh, depending, it's based on, again, on your lifestyle and your values. Uh, but understanding and it, I, what I could say is um, uh, when I had uh, when I have some referral for peer support, um, what I find it, it, that is difficult is people are faced. Um, they're just starting. They've just learned uh, the need to undergo dialysis. Uh, in, in very soon, and they have to make those big decisions. Uh, am I going to do PD or should I do hemodialysis? What's best for me? I want a transplant. Can I get it right away? Those decisions happen very suddenly, and sometimes it can be difficult to make, in, in, um, especially if you need to uh, undergo dialysis pretty quickly. Uh, and, and, and then they direct a bit the, the next few years on how you're going to live. Huh? If you do PD, well, you would do, you would hope to, to keep doing PD on, unless certain things um, make that PD uh, hemodialysis is better for you. Uh, so they, they direct, those decisions really direct how you're going to, to um, conduct your life basically. Uh, and um, that's why it's extremely important to be well informed mm -hmm. uh, to make that proper decision. And, and, and 
the peer support, I think, I hope I was, you know, giving those kind of indications, like really make the decision based on your own uh, choices, uh, on, based on your own values. Um, I did this, but it doesn't mean that treatment is the best for you, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's really individual. Well said, Francois Renee, and I saw that in the chat. Um, Lydia was catching that peer support isn't about giving medical advice. We speak from our own experiences. And we we support one another. Um, if I could add just yeah. briefly, Craig, thank you. Um, I think one of the things that's really key is communication. And uh, certainly we've talked about education and I believe sort of some takeaways for me, the, in terms of things that I've seen that seem to promote patients becoming more engaged is being comfortable, being a bit vulnerable, willing to communicate with the team and begin to develop relationships through that a partnership evolves. And I think patients begin to feel really more of a sense of being a part of a team. And um, so trust is is a part of this and establishing relationships having confidence that your your voice and your input really matters to the team and can inform your care in much of the same ways that Francois Rene and and Piggy are talking about I'm, I'm curious can you think Michelle of a time or an instance like where you've supported a patient to become empowered that has been very inspiring for you, where a patient has met you as a true partner that inspires you to continue. I mean, it's hard enough just being a renal social worker with actually, without actually taking on this patient empowerment uh, aspect. What inspires you? Well, I've been, uh, patients inspire me and I'm inspired by Peggy and Francois Rene, but I would, I've been thinking that, I had the great privilege to participate with a, a dialysis patient in um, an interview with the Kidney Foundation at the time that the financial burden of kidney disease research was done and the report was submitted. And I had reached out to a patient who had previously contacted me and shared about some financial challenges she was experiencing and I asked her if she would be willing to be interviewed as part of helping to really shine a light on the report and that really required her to go outside of her comfort level and but she was really committed to she felt it was so important and she wanted it to make a difference to other patients and so she joined me in doing that and we we together were interviewed and that was our, her story was shared in one of the letters that was sent out that year to potential donors. So I was very inspired by her willingness to share her story, especially a story that was really quite private and um, that she was able to really put her voice raise her voice and use a, a national platform. And actually, just very briefly, the same patient who I met first in renal clinic and who is now has a kidney transplant has um, become very active. Uh, she's uh, has a musical career and she's become very active through the the online um, Nova Scotia kitchen party, which started up last spring when we had um, at the tragic uh, shooting that occurred. So she has, it's like she has just become so um, active and engaged and she's sharing her passion and really um, raising, using her voice. And in her case, she has a beautiful voice. Mm -hmm. And so she is sharing her gift of music and, and I think feeling quite inspired to continue to to shine a light on the experience of kidney patients. Stories matter. They do, and they empower, I believe. And would you say encouraging people to be comfortable sharing their story as our 
two patient experts today. <laughs> it has great value. I, I think people watching this see a little bit of Francois, Rene, and Peggy and themselves, perhaps. That, that's my hope, at least. Yes. Yeah. But appreciate this is you only become a kidney patient once, um, and your journey is different. Um, Francois, Rene, Peggy, any brief last words before we close out? Um, I just want to say that it, it, if I can do it, anyone can. <laughs> uh, I've been doing this and it's just, you know, what happens happens and you just deal with it as it comes and good luck to everyone who's watching. Thank you, Peggy. Francois Rene, very briefly. Yes, again, um, you know, step by step, uh, don't be afraid to ask questions to uh, your healthcare team understand you know your blood work understand what you're going through medically and and especially talk with the people who care about you in your family friends uh, about what you're going through it is important so well said um, and thank you so much you three and for everyone who took the time to join us our three panelists today what a wonderful discussion